Hi everyone. We are very excited to be here for the it's the third year for me. I don't know for Tom and Vasek, but maybe we can start introducing ourselves. Go ahead, uh, Tom or Vasek first, and then we will start with the presentation. Don't be shy. Are you okay. going to choose? Okay. Uh, let me start. My name is Tom Tsofal. Uh, I'm with Red Hat. Uh, I work at the office of the CTO uh, on the open, open services part. Um, what do we do? Uh, we are trying to experiment with stuff. We have, the, we have the liberty to experiment with many different components, many different technologies, and figure out what works the best, what works the best for future products. Uh, and part of our portfolio is investment in data science technologies, AI technologies, uh, and we are helping uh, with some of the upstream projects and also uh, transforming those upstream projects into downstream products uh, within Red Hat. So uh, our focus is mainly, currently mainly on SRE practices, uh, best, best um, principles, uh, how, to, how to operate AI workloads, how to operate data science, and other stuff among others. So that's uh, that's why we claim to have some expertise in this topic, uh, and uh, that's why I'm here for you today. My name is Vasek Pavlin, um, our architect of uh, Open Data Hub, which is the platform that uh, Francisco is going to use, and which Tom is running and uh, and uh, kind of complaining about all the time. Um, this is also my my last uh, <clears throat> week at Red Hat, so uh, it's an honor to be able to present with Francesco and Tom here um, and support them in their endeavor to actually make make AI cloud native on OpenShift. Thanks, Vajek. We are also honored to be with you, actually. Um, so let me start with the presentation. Uh, so my name is Francesco, and I'm also part of the Open Services Group. Uh, so I work uh, I work with uh, Tom and uh, Bajek in these years, and I also work on uh, Project Toth that uh, will be introduced uh, in a moment. So we won't spend too much time on the presentation, so we can focus uh, on the actual work. So let me start uh, briefly introducing uh, some of the technologies that we are going to use uh, today. Um, so you will see Open Data Hub just briefly introduced. If you have uh, any question or any deep question, you have Vasek here, so please feel free to ask. Uh, open first, also we don't spend too much time because there was also a talk that I hope you attended this morning by Marcel Hilt, and uh, he explained uh, uh, what is Open first and how it works. And if you have more question, we are also here, and Tom actually is here, so if you have more question, uh, please ask. Uh, then we will see Project Toast and Project Meteor and uh, all these tools that we're going to use uh, today in this uh, brief workshop. So Open Data Hub. Um, so Open Data Hub is uh, an open source uh, project. Uh, there is a community behind it. And it's basically an AI as a service platform that runs on uh, OpenShift. It's production ready, so it's already used by um, hundreds of users. And it's a meta operator, which uh, means that uh, is able to manage different uh, components through operators. So there are many tools that we are going to see today. And all of these are uh, basically managed and uh, installed by uh, Open Data Hub. And uh, um, there is, as I said, the community behind it. And we will focus on the, some of the most popular uh, AI ML tools. You will see, for example, Elira, Jupyter Hub, and uh, other tools that can be used, uh, for example, for deployments. And the tools that are available actually cover uh, the entire uh, workflow, or sorry, uh, say, yeah, workflow or life cycle of the machine learning. So you will see that uh, we can use uh, uh, tools to uh, analyze data through Jupyter Hub with all the dependencies and TensorFlow and all the different packages available. Uh, we will see that you can run experiments through uh, Kubeflow, for example, and uh, we can run AI pipeline using uh, some specific uh, steps that we want, for example, creating uh, uh, processing some data, uh, training the model, and then once we are happy with our model, we can basically deploy it in the platform directly because Open Data Hub is running uh, on OpenShift, so everything is integrated and uh, very easy to use actually. 
And once we have this model deployed that uh, you will actually deploy, um, you will be able to see, I don't know, some metrics when we try to run uh, the application that we built. So it was very brief. Uh, more question, please. Uh, Vasek is here. Um, regarding Operate First, the same, I won't spend too much time, as I said, uh, but the idea behind it is that uh, uh, there is many of open source everywhere today, and one missing part, actually, of this uh, uh, open world today was uh, basically the operation. So Operate First is uh, a community that wants to um, exploit this, uh, this world, the world of the operations, and uh, wants to include everyone uh, from the community to learn how to uh, maintain application, how to maintain the cluster, how to uh, monitor the cluster, the application, how what are the best decision or um, better solution for some specific uh, uh, tools. And everything is done openly and uh, there is a community there. As I said, if you attended the, uh, the talk this morning, you will see that uh, you're welcome to join and uh, learn all about operation and there is a, community that is, that is growing. So please, if you want, uh, join us. And uh, here are the links. So this presentation will be shared later. But uh, of course, we will use uh, Operate First today. And uh, on Operate First, we will have uh, Open Data Hub that is running and maintained by the Operate First team. And we will see one example that I will explain uh, in a moment. Project TOS uh, is another uh, project available in our group. Uh, Project TOS wants to basically facilitate some of the day-to-day um, -day, uh, tasks that are done by the machine learning uh, developers or the um, data scientists in general. So we want to provide a way to uh, ease their daily job, in particular focusing on the dependencies, which is a very important task when you want to uh, build your application. The first thing you're going to do is select uh, the you know, TensorFlow or PyTorch. And this means that uh, you want to have a way um, to select the, these dependencies in the best way, because uh, depending on the hardware that you're in or the interpreter that you're using, maybe there is some specific uh, um, dependencies that you can use that can boost, for example, performance. Or if you're interested in security, then you can go ahead and uh, receive a certain uh, set of dependencies that uh, uh, will allow you to keep your application safe maybe reducing the performance. So depending on what you want, uh, this uh, tool or this resolver that is provided by TOT is able to give you this uh, recommendation. So TOT overall is a recommender system that is able to give you um, the dependencies based on your need. So you can not just say, I want this uh, dependency, but I want this dependency to be with you know, the most secure or the most performant. So there are other layers on top of the dependencies and in this way, we can provide the recommendation to the users. And the second important thing is the delivering of optimized images. So there are pipelines that have been uh, created and uh, uh, can build the container images that you can run, for example, in OpenShift or in AI pipelines, depending on what you want to do. And the third is the automation. So we want to uh, reduce at the minimum the, the time spent on these kind of things that can be completely automated and can be run by bots. So you can focus uh, specifically on your problem. Uh, there are several integration um, available, but uh, what we will focus today is the one uh, um, provided in JupyterLab. So I will explain this uh, in a moment. Also here you have links if you're interested. And then we have a uh, project Meteor, which is another project uh, that uh, was started in the uh, Open Services Group. and. Uh, Project Meteor is basically a proof of concept on all these tools that uh, have been created that needs to be integrated with uh, uh, the daily tools, for example, used in OD on Open Data Hub. So we want to integrate all these pipelines and run them on, uh, on Tekton or on OpenShift pipelines and provide this uh, added value to the, uh, to the work the, of, the, of the data scientist. In particular, you will see that uh, the tool is basically going to hide everything that is happening from the user. So they want what they want is an environment to run their application. And if I have a GitHub URL, for example, I can just introduce it to, in this tool. And uh, after some machinery and uh, magic, you will get uh, two um, URL. One that is pointing to a Jupyter book. And this Jupyter book is basically the documentation, for example, for your experiment. And we will see the experiment that we created today. And the other one is uh, um, 
bringing you in the Jupyter Hub environment, where we are going to actually do the actual work. And with this, I think uh, that's all. Uh, yes, I took nine minutes, so it's enough. I think we can uh, already move to the actual part. More fun, let's say. If you have any question, please uh, don't hesitate to ask them in the chat. I mean, there is, I don't see uh, always the chat, but uh, there is Tom and Vasek. So if you have any question, uh, uh, please let us know or feel free to interrupt me, please. Um, so what do we do in order to start? Uh, so I created this uh, Excel file that I will post in the chat. Um, I don't remember where to put it. Let me see. So please, if you want to uh, try this workshop or try the, the task that we're going to make today, and uh, remember that you can also continue to do this uh, in the next days or whenever you want, because the the workshop will be open and is always uh, available on GitHub. So if you want to try it, you can run it uh, on Operate First, which is open to everyone. Um, so what you need is basically only a GitHub account and a GitHub token that uh, you can generate uh, easily. And if you don't have one, I'm going to show you in a moment how to do that. So I can give you this in the chat. If you don't have a token, just follow this. So how do we start uh, this workshop? So let's say that you want to start uh, this tutorial by yourself and you find uh, an interesting uh, project. For example, this application that we called, uh, uh, sorry, this tutorial that we call the LIRA AI DevSecOps tutorial. This tutorial is focused on uh, using most of the tools that are available on Open Data Hub. And uh, the application that we're going to focus on is just the uh, NIST classification. So it's a very simple model, but uh, this is to show how you can uh, use all these tools and how actually easy it is to move across the different phases of your project, uh, uh, machine learning project, and how you can deploy this application uh, uh, very, very easily. So we go to the Meteor uh, shower. So if you enter this uh, sheet, you will see that there are two sections. The first one is focus on the uh, steps that we're going to make. I will tell you what is uh, something that you can completely skip. Uh, I already added some, but uh, maybe there is something more that we can skip if we don't have enough time. And the second sheet is basically showing you some of the links that are useful for today. And um, the first one is the shower, um, meter shower link. And once you're here, you will get in this UI. As you can see, the UI is very simple. You can just uh, take the URL of this project and enter it here. And you have some options if you want to I don't know, choose some specific uh, branch of this project, the expiration time, and the components that are going to be created. As I said, there are two uh, URL that we'll get at the end. And in this case, in order to not to waste too much time, I already run this pipeline for you. So you already see, or you should see, that uh, there is a meter available. Please let me know if it's not available. Otherwise, we can do, I mean, you can find it in another uh, way, but you will, you should be able to see it. So if you open this, you will see that uh, this is the final uh, basic status when uh, the pipeline finished and you have the two links available. So one to open the Jupyter Hub and one to open the, the website. The website, we mean the Jupyter book in this case. So if you open that book, these are all the steps that we're going to follow today. I mean, we will try to follow today. And if you don't have time, we can you can always uh, keep trying and uh, following the uh, the description here. So today I will explain most of these uh, steps. And if you have any problem, please remember that you can uh, ask us now or even in the next days or when you or when you want. And you can use, for example, this uh, issue here that we created specifically for today. 
So you can basically just mention the task you were working on based on this uh, spreadsheet and describe your issue and uh, we, will we will try to help you uh, solve the problem if there are any. Hopefully the workshop will go smoothly and you will be able to finish all the steps uh, until the deployment of the application. So if you already, if you're already here, uh, so we saw that you can access the tutorial. This will basically explain the different steps. And there is one link that uh, bring you to the initial environment that you need. This is something that you don't need to do in this case because we are, we are, we are using Meteor. And if you're using Meteor, everything is already uh, prepared for you. So what we do, we just go to this link. And here we will be redirected to the um, Meteor that we want. So in this case, is this one with this code. You have the same uh, here if you don't find uh, the reference. And we can just select the container size, medium or large. I mean, we can go for the medium, and that should be enough, or large. Let's go for large. So now the Jupyter Hub uh, spawner is uh, basically pulling the image if it's not already available. And once the image is uh, created, it's going to be assigned to our uh, use, use uh, username. And then we will enter in the Jupyter Hub uh, environment. So if you want, I will be, um, we will try to um, follow the steps. Please go ahead if you are faster or if you want just to go ahead. We will we will try to follow each of the steps in this uh, in this hour. But uh, if you are faster and you want to uh, also continue, please feel free to do that. I will try to follow these steps meanwhile. So the environment is almost ready. So regarding the application, maybe we can go ahead a bit while we wait for that to be ready. Um, yes. So the first part will be focus on the notebooks. So as you see, here we are in the Jupyter Hub. Envi uh, Jupyter Lab environment, and you should see that you have a repo that uh, was created uh, with the the timestamp also. This is uh, to avoid that uh, anything that is already present uh, in your environment, sorry, in your uh, yes environment volume that is attached for your uh, um, for your image to be lost. So in this way, you don't uh, uh, override anything, and I have two because I was already starting uh, before, but you should see that you have uh, only one in this case. So if you open here, you will see that this is the structure of the project that actually we were having a look from GitHub. So this was imported here automatically. And this is uh, actually something that uh, uh, you don't have to do. You Typically, you have to uh, clone the repo. If you see that uh, this is the first thing that you can, uh, you should do in the step, but uh, you don't have to do this in this case because we are already uh, in the environment. And one interesting uh, um, plugin that is available in Jupyter uh, in Jupyter Lab, actually in this case, sent to Elira, is the Jupyter Lab Git extension. So whenever we change something, for example, if I open anything of this. Um, and I save it, for example. You should see that uh, it immediately identified that there was a change in my project. And if I'm happy with it, I can just uh, move it uh, to the stage, as you will do with the, using Git. And then if you're happy, you can try and just uh, um, make the description of uh, what is the change, I don't know, modified. Um, 
the config YAML. And then you can just try to commit. And once you commit, you can open a pull request in the in that repository. In this case, there is uh, some uh, uh, thing that you need to enter. So for Git, for Git to work, you need to provide your name and uh, email that is attached actually to the to your GitHub account, and then you will be able to push. In this case, uh, the environment uh, uh, I won't add them here right now, but uh, once you add yours, you will be able to also push to the repo and eventually open up a request in that uh, in that environment. So regarding the application itself, as I said, is a NIST classification uh, application. And if you go to, to notebooks and then TensorFlow um, NIST classification, you can see that there are two uh, notebooks. The first one is basically a very simple notebook that you can use to download the data set. So the data set is available through um, TensorFlow. And so you will be able to run this uh, notebook um, in order to collect the data. Regarding uh, the dependencies, as I said, this is a very important thing that you would do typically when you start the project, but also you want to make sure that uh, if I give this notebook to someone else, they will be able to run this notebook uh, without any problem. And how do we do that? Uh, I mentioned that Project Auth has several integration, and one of them is called JupyterLab Requirements. And this is available actually in all these uh, environments uh, by default. So whenever you try and do something like Aorus uh, check, which is the CLI provided by JupyterLab Requirements and also the magic commands uh, that are integrated in the notebook, should be able to see that uh, this notebook has been basically created with that uh, um, extension. And that means that uh, I can find the requirements. So all the packages that I use when I was creating this notebook, now they are available here. I have the requirements lock. So not just the dependency like TensorFlow, but all the dependency and transitive dependencies that are coming with TensorFlow are going to be stored in this notebook metadata. If you want to see them here, you can go to advanced tools. And for example, you can see that uh, the resolution engine that was used to create these uh, dependencies, the requirements that I used. So as you see, there was TensorFlow, Boto3, and the requirements lock. So in this case, I can uh, reinstall the same environment if I want. And there is uh, a specific command in order to do that. You can also see, for example, the dependencies that were used, so TensorFlow, Boto3, and Matplotlib. This is just uh, if you want to run it uh, directly in the notebook. And if you want to install the same environment, you would do Aorus uh, set kernel. And then you can also choose the name of the kernel if you want. I don't know, uh, DevConf US. And this will basically start creating a new kernel that is um, used to run this notebook. It will take some time, but uh, I mean, don't worry, this is not important. This is just to show that uh, these tools are created uh, to help you in uh, the development of your project. So the dependency are a very important thing, and uh, we want to make this uh, very easy for the, for the users, so they don't need to focus on that. And there, are also, there is also, as I said, the magic commands, but you can also use this uh, uh, extension through the UI that is available through this uh, button here. Or you can also uh, run it if you use the terminal of JupyterLab. We should have the command directly here. So if you want to do some uh, specific things on, on your notebook, you see that there are all the commands. Uh, for example, the one we use was set kernel or show. The, these are all available if you want to do this in uh, from the command line. So we provide different possibility depending on the um, preferences of the users. So when this will be done, uh, I mean, it's a big uh, uh, software stack, so it will take uh, some time at the moment. 
but we can go ahead meanwhile and see what is the other steps what are what are the other steps um so the second step is once you get the data and typically you should process them if they are not uh, provided already in a nice uh, state in this case it's uh, quite easy because uh, tensorflow already provide you with the uh, um, defined data set and that is already ready to be used and this part is more focused on the training of the model so if you see here um we create the we split the data set, we create the convolutional neural network, and then once we are ready, we just uh, run it and test the model uh, that was created. And finally, the model will be stored on a specific uh, place, either locally or on a storage um, that is provided. So these two steps, as you see, it finished and it already assigned the new kernel so this new kernel has been created now and this uh, containing all the dependencies that were created through this through this step you don't need this uh, uh, in your notebook anymore but now that you are ready uh, you can basically run the notebook and this you can do the same for this other notebook if you're interested so once the notebook is ready or the two notebooks are ready typically what you do is uh, saving everything I showed you a few minutes ago, this is something uh, also a very good practice to every time you modify something or at the end of your day to just save everything or push it to your main source. In this case is our GitHub repo. In this way, we can allow others to um, contribute to your project. So if you're working on a specific application, typically you would have uh, maybe more people working on that. And they also want to, um, you know, contribute or work or help you in a specific uh, part. So typically, this is a good practice to push everything and save uh, uh, everything in the in your in your main source. Another thing I did mention is that uh, some good practices also uh, can be helpful in terms of the structure of the project. As you see, this uh, specific project uh, has a structure. And this is not a random structure. This is actually uh, a structure that was uh, created in our uh, in our team. It's based on the cookie cutter templates, if you are familiar with that. And then we added uh, some specification depending on the tools that are integrated, uh, like uh, the, for example, there is the TOT configuration file and the SOE configuration file. These are all specific configuration that we use uh, in our projects. But in general, it's a good practice to have this structure. Why is that? Because uh, you typically have different personas that work in the project. And typically, if you want to look for something, you don't need to think, uh, where can I find this one? So it's very easy to find, for example, immediately, if I want to have a look at the notebooks, I know that they are all stored here. So there is a structure here. And in this case, I'm a data scientist, for example. But if I am uh, an uh, DevOps or AI DevOps person, and I want to deploy your application, I want to know where are, for example, the manifests. And this is something that you can also find easily if you have a certain structure that is uh, agreed, of course, uh, among your team. But uh, I mean, it doesn't have to be the same everywhere, but uh, depending on your team, of course, you can adapt it. But it's a good practice to have this. And uh, we typically have this in, in our projects. So, so if you are following the different steps, you will basically uh, already enter the operate first in a way. Uh, this is not something that uh, you saw, but uh, basically you entered through the meter uh, link. So we are already in the operate first environment. Sorry. So we can say that this was done. We already ties that we wanted. We already entered in our uh, repo. We don't have to clone it in this case, so you can skip it. As I said, the Meteor is basically preparing the environment for you. We already saw the Oros commands, and we already talked about pushing the changes when you're happy about it. So let's say that now I have my different notebooks, and uh, what I want to do typically is, once I'm happy with the, no with the different steps that I want to run, is that uh, I need to um, repeat, for example, if there are any pipelines or any workflow that uh, needs to be run. For example, in the MLOps concept, 
typically would be a pipeline for retraining the model and redeploying everything once uh, it's uh, recreated. And having pipelines is also quite common. And if you want to test these pipelines, there is uh, the LIR extension available uh, in these projects in Open Data Hub. Elira is basically an extension for JupyterLab that uh, have an easy UI to create these pipelines. We're going to see in a moment how you can create this pipeline, um, but we're going, not going to run them today. So I'm going to show you what is the pipeline editor and what are the different uh, steps that you have to do in order to run them. But they will take some time, and uh, there is no opportunity probably today to run them, at least not. Uh, not today. So typically, the pipelines, you just open your editor. And uh, you can enter in this pipeline uh, either notebooks or some specific uh, um, Python code, if you want, or also R. R is also available in uh, with, so the JupyterLab extension. So depending on how you prepare or create your different steps, maybe the, the processing uh, step is done in a Python uh, script, but uh, the training is always done maybe in a notebook. So this is quite flexible depending on what you want to do. And if we go to the to our step, this is quite uh, straightforward. So you can import them directly in this uh, editor. And you can see that uh, this will be, for example, my initial pipeline that I want to rerun after some time. And this is the typical flow that I want. The first step needs to download all my data and store them in a specific place. And then I want to train the model using this data and store this model, of course, in another place that I can reuse later. There is one important thing or two important things that you need to prepare in order to run this pipeline. So first of all, you have to imagine that each of these steps, oops, each of these steps has some specific property that you need uh, to select. So on the back, this is uh, hidden by the user from the users, but basically this notebook will run in a specific uh, container. So you need to select a specific image to run it. And typically this image is uh, something that uh, can be created uh, uh, through automated pipelines. As I mentioned at the beginning, all these uh, container images can be automatically created uh, and I will show you in a moment how we usually do that in our team. We don't have to do this today because we already prepared all the images in case, but uh, uh, as we are not running the, the, the pipeline today, I'm just going to show you how this can be done and why this is important also. So as I said, we are here and what you can do, you can uh, basically select uh, an image. These are predefined and the uh, default images available through Elira, but you can also have your own one. In order to do that, we can do Control Shift, Control Shift C, and you can have you have several commands here, and you can, for example, manage your runtime images. These are the images you saw a few moments ago, available here. And if you want just a new one, you can uh, select your name, DevConf US, uh, say download. And you can select the image. Where are these image? In this case, you can find them going to your Jupyter book. And if you go to create AI pipeline, you will see that uh, these are all the steps that I'm following. If you want to repeat everything, you can just uh, follow again. Or if you have any problem, of course, let us know. And you can see that here you have the image. This is the image name that we would introduce here. And the uh, other option, if you are uh, familiar with those, otherwise just follow the usual uh, default. And this new image would be available here. And of course, this will be available in a moment also here. So we will be able to um, select each of them. Beside the image, what else you can select? There are also the resources that you want. So if you have want to run this uh, step, specific step, not just uh, not everything, but just this specific step with GPU or CPU, then you can select it. For example, in training is something very common if you have uh, uh, big models to, to use GPU. So in that case, you can also allocate resources depending on your step. 
So maybe in the first one, you don't need to do GPU, but in the second one, you require that, then you can also uh, tune, depending on your requirement, what you, can, uh, what you can select. And there are other things, for example, if you have environment variables or other specific uh, um, environment variables to have uh, to provide. And you do the same, of course, also for the second step. Um, this is highlighting the error because I, I'm not handing uh, any image, but you can see that uh, this is solved, for example. And as I said, these are the images that are required for each of these steps, but then how you actually run this uh, pipeline. So what you usually do, we go back to the usual control shift C, and you can see that you can do manage Kubeflow pipeline runtimes. There are no runtimes already uh, created at the moment. There is no default because it's something that you need to create. And you need to choose also the engine that is going uh, to run these pipelines. So we use uh, Kubeflow in our team. And uh, on the back, actually, we, you can select if you want uh, Tekton or Argo, which are do two other open source tools that you can uh, use to run the pipelines. We usually use Tekton. We're not going to fill this because we are going, not going to run them, but uh, these are all information that you can uh, find and uh, are provided if you want to run the pipelines. So you just select a name and uh, the different uh, information related to the inputs. But as I said, we're not going to run because there is uh, uh, no time. But in general, this is just to show. Um, so you add your initial project you know how to enter in the environment, you know that uh, you can create your own notebooks and you can save them when you want in your project, in your GitHub project. Once you're happy, then you want to basically experiment with these pipelines. So what you do, you create this uh, AI pipeline and you saw that it's very trivial to do that. What is important is that you have the images. How do we create these images? So in our team, we have, uh, uh, CICD in place, and it's actually another application which is called the uh, AI CI. And this application is available in most of the projects and can be installed as a GitHub app. And the second GitHub app is actually um, the Kebeshet app, which is one of the bot that I mentioned uh, at the beginning. We want to automate most of the things so that uh, you don't have to focus on that. And they should be available in each of these steps. Or well, we can go directly here. Um, so the, regarding ICI, there are two things that you need to have. So once you install this, these two application on the, which are available on GitHub from the GitHub marketplace, you can uh, basically select this uh, configuration file. And this, in this configuration file, you can decide what uh, images and what container you want to create, sorry, what uh, images you want to create. And typically you have, uh, um, you can select the name and the base image that you want to use and the type of build that you want to have. So if you want to build from source or you have, if you are familiar with it, some container file where you specify either type of uh, um, some specific instruction that needs to be followed in the container image uh, creation. And you can do this for several steps. For example, here we have several steps. And as you can see here, you have the two steps that I mentioned um, before. And so these two images are already available. And if you want to see them, once the AISOE pipeline create these images, automatically they will be available on the container registry, which is an open container registry publicly available. And these images are available here, as you see. And why this is important, this is also important in order to trace what you're using in your project. So as you see, there are different version or tags that are uh, named for each of these images. So we can immediately identify where is the problem and what kind of version it was working and which one we need to use for depending on the project. And this is, of course, <coughs> a good practice that uh, is taken by the software engineering uh, practices. But GetTick is also very useful if you want to do data science, because you always want to be able to repeat these experiments and allow others to repeat these experiments. Um, yes, so this is the reg regarding the images. So we are basically talking about uh, these uh, steps.
And let's say that you already run the pipeline and you already created the model. Then this model, for example, if it's small enough, can be stored also on your GitHub repo. But typically, this will be stored on some specific storage because the models are actually not so small um, in machine learning in general. So what we can do if we want to deploy a model. So we basically now have uh, everything. We run the pipeline. We have the model. And now I created a container, an image for that model. You saw that uh, before. Uh, of course, this is typically an expertise of uh, a DevOps person. So the data scientists provide the model, and then uh, um, the AI DevOps needs to uh, containerize it and create some specific, uh, for example, endpoints for this. If you use Flask, you need to provide, for example, a specific logic to it. And uh, we have typically two endpoints that we provide. One is for the metrics, and one is uh, for the predictions. So when we want to predict, based on the model. But of course, you can have, uh, uh, depending on uh, your project, other type of solutions. And regarding the, the deployment itself, actually, this is not the only solution, because the deployment of the model can be done on with several ways. Uh, we are working on adding other examples, not just the Flask application, but there are other tools that are available, like Seldon, OpenVino, KF Serving. So there are different solutions. And uh, the deployment can be done even uh, more easily using this tool because, for example, Seldon just required the model URL, so you don't need to do anything else. The model just to, needs to be provided in a certain way, and you don't have even to create uh, the the logic to it. So, as you see, there are different solutions, and all of them actually are going to be or are already available in uh, Open Data Hub, and you can use them. So, regarding the deployment of the model that we're going to see today, how do we deploy a model uh, typically in our team? So if you are testing the, uh, for example, the deployment, we usually go through um, deploying this with, through manifests. And these manifests, as I said before, are available in uh, this path, as we, say, as we mentioned before. So we know exactly where to find them. And there are three specific uh, objects that we use, which are um, used in the OpenShift. In this case, we use the deployment config. So this deployment is basically describing what type of deployment you want um, and some specific, uh, for example, image that you want to use. So there are some information that you can provide. These are specific uh, to, the, to the Kubernetes world and to the OpenShift world. And, uh, this is one way, of course. Once we have this manifest, what we can do is just, uh, and this is what we're going to see today. You can just uh, apply them directly. But what we do also today is uh, automating this. So the user doesn't have, doesn't have to uh, basically do this manually. But typically, there is uh, uh, a solution that is completely automated, which is uh, the use of Argo CD. So Argo CD is another tool that we use. I don't know if you are familiar with it, but uh, Argo CD basically, OK, this is not available. So Argo CD is basically uh, integrated with the, with, the, with the GitHub project. So you can uh, use uh, GitOps in order to um, deploy everything related to a specific application. So in this way, you can track whatever it is declaratively, what is in the cluster. And if you modify anything in your GitHub uh, project that uh, maintain this application, you can directly modify what is happening in the cluster. So in this way, we can have more control and this uh, uh, integrated with the GitHub, uh, uh, GitHub's best practices. So there are these two ways. But today, we're going to see one of them. And it's directly the use of the uh, of the manifest that have been already created and available for you. The only thing I ask you is to modify um, the three objects that we're going to see today. One is uh, the deployment config. So whenever you find the name of the of this uh, specific object, just add your um, username. So my username in GitHub is uh, Paco Space, for example. You can just add yours in order to test this if you want. And please do it uh, um, for all of them. 
And the same thing needs to be done for the other two objects that we use. In this case are the route and the service. So once you have uh, these three, then you can uh, we can basically deploy the application. And let's see how to do that directly from the terminal. So we are in the terminal. So we are in our operate first and OpenShift uh, inside the cluster. So we want to connect to OpenShift. How do we do that? If you go to the links that I provide in this uh, spreadsheet, you can see that there are other links. So you can, for example, open the Red Hat OpenShift console. And if you want to find your login commands, you can basically go here and display your token. Once you get your token, you just copy the, um, you can copy all the thing, yes, all the command and just run it uh, here. I won't copy it because uh, I don't want to show my token, but if I'm already connected, yes, I'm already connected in this case, so you should, you, I can already run this. So the project that you're gonna use is called uh, um, namespace. I copied here, but okay. It's called uh, DEFCON demo. So you can actually also access it from here if you want to see the namespace. Ah. Yes. So this is the namespace that I want to access. How do we do this with OpenShift? You just go here and you say, what's the project? Oh, that's weird. Then I need to refer to my expert in uh, Opet first, Tom. I'm looking into it. Thank you. Seems like you're not logged in. Okay. I thought I did it, then wait a second. Let me do it again. Yeah, the project is still there and accessible, so. And the RPEC hasn't changed. Tom, thank you, Vajek. That's why you bring experts when you do this workshop. Um, so now we are back, and as you can see, we are already in the cluster. So how do we apply those manifests? We have to do OC apply to the correct path. Um, should be in. So this is the latest one manifest and we go to base so what we do we just do OC apply all of them but just the route service and the deployment config So now if we go in the cluster and we see the pods, you will see that uh, the application is uh, uh, scaling up. And this is basically how you deploy this directly from the manifest. As you can see, uh, once the container images are ready, this is uh, quite straightforward and very easy. And while the application is deployed, what we can do is having a look at uh, testing this application. So another important thing with 
of course, having metrics for your applications. And if you want to see them, yes. So as I said, there are two endpoints that we created. And if you see the route of this application, you should be able to see that the endpoint called metrics, exposing the metrics of my Flask application. So these metrics are already available and we're gonna test the application now. How to do that? We go to the notebooks. There's one notebook called test deployed model. Um, I think so. This should work. If not, we will see. Um, okay. Why is not working? I need to recreate the environment then. Okay, so we don't have the environment for this specific notebook, so we need to recreate it. And we call it test model. Oh, while this is running, uh, I don't know if you want to, if you have any question, meanwhile. Anyone ask any specific questions? Still running. Francesco, you're not sharing your screen anymore. Is that intentional? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Coming. Oh, I was checking actually if there are any questions meanwhile. But apparently, we don't have questions at the moment. So hopefully, everything is uh, clear. Let me switch off can you see my screen Not yet. Uh, pa, pa, pa. no Yes. Yes. Okay. Meanwhile, uh, the command finished. I added uh, basically all the things that were required. Now, if I want to test, I need my uh, cluster URL, which is available here. my cluster URL, I should be already logged in. Yes. I can see my pods. Yes, I can take my the routes. Yes, and now I want to test basically the application. So we can use the correct URL of the application. And the predict endpoint is correct. If this run, 
yes. Let me remember, yes. Okay, this was not updated. Uh, we don't need to show the output. So this is basically reaching out to the endpoint and we can see that from here, we should have some metrics, yes. You see, I was hitting the endpoint with this uh, API calls, and this provided me with the um, recommendation. Um, sorry, for with the prediction related to the model. And as you can see, as, it's a, as it is a NIST classification model, my input is this image, and you see that the model predicted that it is a zero correctly. We can change this to see another example. It's a bit more complex, but is a seven, as you can see, is correctly identified. And that's basically it, I think. Uh, we have five minutes left, so I was fast enough, I think, to finish all the steps. I hope, uh, I know it was a bit fast, but uh, the idea was to show all this concept and uh, all the tools that can be used. And um, hopefully you, you will get to finish each of these uh, steps. And uh, otherwise, remember that you can always uh, reach, out, reach out to us. Um, I show you that you can open uh, any issue if you have any problem in any of the, of the task. So just use this uh, link and open issues if you have any. So in this case, we can help you finish the workshop or if you have any question in general about uh, any of the tools that you saw today or if you want to join us to the community, and operate first, just uh, let us know. We will share the slide later so you will have all the links. And in general, I hope you had fun. Uh, for us, it's always a pleasure to be at uh, DevConf. And uh, let's see. Uh, thank you very much.